Hello, I'm Richard Wender. I'm the Chief Cancer Control Officer at the American Cancer Society, and I also have the honor of being the chair of the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable. And today we're going to talk about a critical public health goal, reaching 80% colon cancer screening rates by the end of 2018. This initiative was originally recommended and endorsed by the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable, a group of over 80 organizations, now approaching 100 organizations, uh, that were responding to 10 events, accomplishments, and decisions that have all converged to create this extraordinary public health opportunity to substantially reduce colon cancer as a major public health problem. This is not the beginning of the effort. In fact, it's now a big push to the finish line of the effort. Uh, in 2012, according to BRFSS survey, 65% of U.S. adults were actually up to date with screening. Uh, and there was virtually no uh, dis uh, disparity based on uh, skin color. Uh, we know that colonoscopy has been the big increase in the way that people were screened. Uh, now 61% of that 65% were screened through colonoscopy uh, and only 10% through an annual stool blood test. We've seen the results of these efforts. Colorectal cancer incidence is coming down dramatically, not in the younger age group, so uh, possibly due to poor diets and lack of adequate exercise, but in the screening age groups, uh, we're seeing rapid declines in incidence. And that's been followed by mortality as well, both black, white, men and women, all seeing reductions in mortality. And this graphic really speaks to me because if you look at the decades that have passed in each successive decade, the percent decline in colorectal cancer death rates has accelerated. And in the past decade, we saw a 25% decline in colorectal cancer death rates. And all the screening that we did from 2000 to 2010 is going to result in even more decline in mortality in the following decade. But what I want to really focus on today is what it's going to take to achieve this very important goal. And I've identified 10 steps that we all need to share responsibility for. One, we need to educate clinicians. Two, we need to reach the newly insured. Three, we have to engage effectively with the healthcare payers. Four, we have to find effective ways to communicate with the insured population, but is, who's not very worried about colon cancer and hasn't acted about it. Number five, we have to make sure that everyone can have access to colonoscopy. Six, we have to ensure that everyone can be offered a stool blood test. Seven, create powerful, committed medical neighborhoods around federally qualified health centers. Eight, recruit as many partner organizations as possible. Nine, intensive efforts to reach low socioeconomic populations. And 10, believe that we can achieve this goal. So let's walk through each of these steps. Number one, convene and educate clinicians and their organizations because there are still misunderstandings about screening guidelines. Um, the main two tests recommended now, not the only ones by different groups, but the main two are colonoscopy every 10 years or a fecal immunochemical test every year with colonoscopy following every positive test. High sensitivity guaiac FOBT as opposed to the immunochemical test is an acceptable alternative and certainly being used in some places. Here's the good news. Based on modeling data, colonoscopy every 10 years and a fecal immunochemical test done every year with follow-up colonoscopy for positives prevent the same number of colon cancer deaths. The key here is that's assuming 100% compliance. Bottom line, we have two good strategies and we need to take advantage of both. Number two, find strategies to reach the newly insured. 10 million newly insured Americans are going to even be more than that by the end of this year. Um, and several million of these individuals are eligible for colon cancer screening, which creates an enormous opportunity to move a cohort from the unscreened group to the screened group. Number three, we must more effectively engage healthcare payers. Healthcare in insurers play a critical role in achieving high screening rates. HEDIS uh, is, uses CRC screening rates as one of the measures to evaluate plans, so they have an incentive to do this. They have data, so they can give reports to practices about their screening gaps. Uh, my practice in Jefferson has used that extensively. They can directly reach patients through, through uh, various forms of communication to recommend screening. Uh, and they can absolutely set goals and institute policies to achieve high screening rates. In fact, health plans have been a real important conduit. 
the top performers are at 80% and some are approaching 90% in their enrolled populations. And they're doing this with both closed and open panel models. So there's a variety of models to follow, uh, and, uh, but we won't get there if we don't really get them behind this goal. Um, one of the ways to engage healthcare payers to, is to engage employers. Uh, employers can build in incentives for employees, have clear expectations for coverage, and can set a, a uh, goal within their own companies to achieve 80%. Number four, we must more effectively engage the insured unworried well. And I don't mean to say that these people don't have life worries, they do, but they tend not to be very worried about colon cancer screening. In fact, here's what we've learned from research that the American Cancer Society has conducted. These individuals consider themselves to be healthy, but in fact, they're less likely to visit the doctor, talk about screening, or have a personal connection to cancer. Further, they have the impression that if they don't have symptoms or a family history, they don't need to be screened, and you and I know that screening has nothing to do with symptoms, and most people who develop colon cancer have no family history. Perhaps most concerning of all is that they're less likely to be swayed by a doctor's recommendation, so we really do need some new messages. Here's what we learned in our research. We have to address affordab affordability, um, a lack of health insurance, the sense that they have out-of-pocket expenses, number one barrier. Two, we have to debunk this myth that somehow screening is related to symptoms. Three, we have to uh, help people understand that, that most people who develop colon cancer, 80%, have no family history. Uh, and that's not a factor in deciding whether to be screened or not. Uh, we have to address perceptions about the unpleasantness of the test, uh, because that also emerged as an important barrier and we need to have messages that matter. And number five, this is something we can absolutely do something about. The doctor didn't recommend it. Well, it's up to us to put the systems in place to make sure that recommendation occurs. And number, uh, uh, the final item is this priority of other health, other health issues. Uh, I just turned 50, I'm dealing with another health problem, um, and we have to help people understand this is for everybody. Number five, we have to make colonoscopy as widely available as possible. Uh, most of the increase in screening from 2000 to 2010 was due to a 36% 36, 36 increase in colonoscopy rates. We have to make sure that colonoscopy is available to everyone, because look at this simple graphic. Um, everyone who was, if you have a group of 1,000 unscreened in 2015 and we're able to reach half of them with colonoscopy, they're done for the next 10 years so that in 2016 we can focus on uh, the 500 who didn't get the colonoscopy one year. Uh, and we can keep moving the rates higher and higher over that 10-year period. With fecal immunochemical test, it's a great test, but it's only good for one year. So everyone who we reached in 2015 has to be reached again in 2016 and again in 2017. And if we're going to raise the rates, we have to find a way to reach more people than we reached in any one year. At the same time, number six, we must ensure that everyone can be offered a stool blood test option because we know that some people just won't get a colonoscopy. Anyone who hesitates should be offered an FIT. We've proven now that FIT in a meta-analysis is more sensitive than hemocult or any uh, fecal uh, guaiac test. Uh, and we also have shown, because it's simpler to do with no dietary restriction, that the return rate is higher. Um, we believe that FIT should essentially replace the guaiac FOBT uh, using evidence-based proven FDA-approved FITs. There's a whole bunch that are available in the United States uh, that meet those criteria, uh, and uh, any one of them is good. The PolyMedCo test probably is one that's had uh, more data than uh, almost any other. Why is this so important? Because in a diverse sample of adults, given side-by-side -side description, over half preferred the stool test, and half of those felt very strongly about their choice. Uh, same thing in low income settings, uh, about a third preferred colonoscopy, a little less preferred the stool blood test, you have to offer both. And most importantly, did people actually complete the test? Again, this is in a low uh, uh, income setting. Uh, only about a third actually did the colonoscopy, whereas two thirds did the stool test. So we must have the ability to offer an alternative to colonoscopy. Working through medical neighborhoods around FQHCs is a critically important way we're going to achieve our goal. The FQHCs are caring for 20 million people, 
Uh, mo more than two-thirds are uninsured or have medical assistance. Uh, we must engage these safety net uh, practices in the efforts, but we have to make sure they have a specialty network that can provide colonoscopies, that can provide anesthesiologies, and if treatment is needed, can provide treatment. The NCCRT and the ACS are funding a links of care grant program. We're starting with three pilot projects, uh, proving that it is possible to create this medical neighborhood and showing the impact. Uh, more and more organizations are signing the pledge, and this is number eight. We must recruit as many partner organizations as possible. What this pledge says is that we're committing our organizational resources to getting it done. And look at all of these organizations who, are ta who have signed the pledge and we're still going. 175 have already signed and we're looking for much more. We truly need every organization, every commission on cancer hospital being a great example uh, to sign this pledge and really dedicate resources. Reaching individuals of low income, low education level is particularly challenging. If you look at the current rates of screening in FQHCs, they're at 30 percent. Many Native American tribes have very low screening rates and some with very high mortality. We're going to need different models to do this. Uh, some services must be donated and universal sharing of this responsibility ensures that not, not any one colonoscopy or treatment center is overwhelmed. We need innovative models such as navigators and community health workers which have been proven to work. And number 10, so importantly, we must believe that we can achieve this goal. We've made enormous progress in the past decade, but we're now striving to increase screening rates by 15 percent in just five years, and now we're down to four years. Signing a pledge is not enough. Every organization has to truly dedicate their thought, their time, their resources, and their passion to getting this done. We understand that there are many important public health problems and goals, but we have a chance right now to do something remarkable if we pull together to do it. We truly can substantially reduce colon cancer as a major public health problem. I say to everyone, let's get this one done, and then we'll move on to the next goal. If 80 by 18 is a slogan, we have no hope of achieving this goal. But if 80 by 18 is a call to action, it can be done. Thanks so much for listening and for all of the efforts you will make to re reach 80% colon cancer screening rates by 2018.